Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, turn with me to Romans chapter 1. Oh, wow. Okay. I called this message something far greater, and uh, you'll, you'll figure out why I called it that particular name. Uh, let's open in a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you for everything, and we thank you for who you are. We thank you for this beautiful night and this beautiful time of fellowship. We thank you that you're here to meet us. We pray that you just push back or clean out or purge anything that could stop us or hinder us from uh, receiving what you have for us tonight because we want to receive it, Lord. In your precious name we say this. Amen. Now, you know, there's a lot in these first scriptures, and, and I have gone over them time and time again, because you have to sort of approach it from different perspectives when you're going to point out different aspects of something. And you're going to get some of a summary, and the reason why is because there's an important part in these scriptures that if you don't keep that in mind, uh, you're not going to appreciate what's being said. Because what you're seeing here is sort of a foundation being laid. And it's setting a tone for the book of Romans itself. And uh, you want to sort of keep that in mind as you begin to study or you begin to consider the book of Romans for that reason. Now, we're going to be looking at different subjects Basically, a lot of the same subjects all through the book of Romans. And there's a reason for that. And we're going to get into that a little bit uh, tonight. Now, as we have established, Paul established his authority up front. We know that he distinguished his calling. He revealed that uh, he was, uh, what he was about to write was uh, verified by promises and prophecies of the Old Testament. So what are you saying? I'm not saying anything new. That's what he's saying. I'm not saying anything new to you that you don't already, uh, you can't find out in the Old Testament Torah or whatever. It's nothing new. And you have to remember that. The New Testament is nothing new. It's just a revelation of the old. And that's what makes it new. It's a revelation of the old. And so this is what Paul is saying. I'm not writing anything new. Now, he reveals the validity of his authority. This is very important, of course, because without the authority, you don't have the credibility. And so he's laying all this out. Uh, he's talking about the fact that without the authority, there can be no foundation that you can lay with validity. So to lay a foundation, he had to confirm his authority. Now, this letter was to establish not only his authority, but establish some foundation. And what he really brings out, what is our foundation? Well, in 1 Corinthians 3.11, he says it's a person. It is not doctrine. It's not all this religious affiliation. It's not, well, I believe this or I believe that. It's the person of Jesus Christ. And so Paul very clearly brings out who Jesus Christ is up front in these scriptures. Because if you don't get Jesus Christ right, you don't get anything right. He is the narrow way. Now when the Bible talks about the way is narrow and it's hard, it's talking about that only the person of Jesus and his work of redemption can save you. Nothing else can. And it's a hard way because it's the way of the cross. You have to go by way of the cross of what Jesus did, that redemption, become identified with that cross, that work of redemption that Jesus did, in order to enter into the lives that God has for you. Now, it's not being brought out that way. We have made it very, well, flimsy, the presentation of salvation. We have made it so flimsy that people don't really understand what salvation is and that is something you have to enter in through Christ. And so Paul lays out who Jesus Christ is 
Now, of course, he, he presents him up front as the Savior. We know that. That he's the Christ of the promised one. And he bridges the reality of salvation of his humanity with his deity. Because you have to have both his humanity and his deity to fulfill and bring forth the gospel. Because it's in his humanity he had to die on the cross. He was the Lamb of God, but it's in his deity that resurrection was possible. And you have to have both. You have to have that reality of the sacrificial lamb that took our place on the cross. But you have to have that reality that if he didn't raise from the grave, our preaching would be in vain and we would still be dead in our sins. Now we got to get him right. Now Jesus Christ was declared to be the Son of God. That puts him within the Godhead, his position, his place, with power according to the spirit of holiness. Now people say, well, you know, I don't know about the gospel, but there's power in the gospel, the true gospel, not the gospel we hear today. The true gospel has the power of salvation if you believe it. In sincerity. So it's according to the spirit of holiness. And this declaration has to do with establishing the gospel. Which was verified by Jesus' resurrection. Again, people, it's not enough that Jesus died for us. He had to raise again. That is very important. And that's part of the gospel. The problem is man only sticks with the sentimental aspect of him dying for him, not raising again. Because if he raises again and we serve a living Lord, we are responsible to that risen Lord. We are responsible because we have been bought with the price. That's what it means for him to be Lord in our life. We don't have a right to call the shots in our life. Now we'd like to, but how does that work for you? You know, Jesus Christ owns us. He's Lord. Now, we have to oftentimes get back to that, and Paul said that. Now, we know that we are to confess him as Lord. We're to confess it. Now, confession has to do with a binding contract. It's as if you're making a contra contract with him that he is Lord. So if he's Lord, he owns you. He owns you. It's that simple. You are responsible to him, and he's responsible to take care of you. But he can't take care of you unless you're being responsible to him. And that's the bottom line. So you have to confess he's Lord. You come into that contract, that agreement, and you have to believe in your heart he was raised from the dead to be saved. That's what it requires. It's a heart issue, not a mental ascent. As some people present it. Now without being man. Jesus could not pay the price of redemption. And without being deity. He would have no resurrection. It all comes back to that. And of course we know. That he was. A servant serving the saints. He wanted to serve the saints of all the churches. And he wanted to serve the saints. Of Rome. Now we see the desire of Paul's attitude towards the saints of Rome. And such a, he had such a pure desire because it was all about love. He really loved them. He cared about them. He wanted to identify with them. He wanted them to experience the kindness of God and the peace of God in their lives. But that all comes down to your relationship with God. He wanted them to understand how grace was truly extended through Jesus Christ. From the Father. That it flows downward. But out of that comes the kindness of God. And it brings you into a place of peace with God. And he wanted to see that. For the Roman. The saints. Now we looked at this. But a pattern was set up by uh, Jesus in Matthew 6. In regard to prayer. And we see Paul beginning with that pattern. Of approaching God through Christ. In order to intercede on behalf of this church. He wanted to be that person that stood in the gap 
for them. And he wanted to make sure that he was faithful. And of course, we can read about this pattern or model in, in Matthew 6. They call it the Lord's Prayer, but really it's the disciples' prayer. The Lord's Prayer is found in John 17. That's when he actually prayed. But he, they came to Jesus and said, show us how to pray. So this was a model that he gave. Now, you can pray it, but it's not really the prayer itself. It is to give you an idea, a disciple, an idea how to pray and what to pray for. That's the bottom line of it. Now, Paul acknowledged their faith. And he said it had been spoken about throughout the whole world. Now, that's something to think about. Now, we're going to talk about faith a lot. How much does Paul talk about faith in the book of Romans? A lot, really. You get down to it. He's hitting faith from every direction. And when we get done with looking at Faith, according to Romans, uh, this pathetic presentation of faith today is going to crumble into disarray. It's taken me quite a few years to understand faith because I had my own ideas. But without it, there's no salvation because we are saved by grace through faith. That's Ephesians, of course. Faith has to do with our life, our walk. It's all about faith. Not faith in what God can do, but who he is. And boy, people really need to get that. You say, God can do this. Well, yeah, God can maybe do it. But he doesn't do things because he can do it. He does it according to who he is. And I'm going to prove that point to you time and time again. Because I am so sick of the disgusting presentation of faith that I hear today. It's heretical. It's a pseudo-faith. And it's setting people up to be destroyed. To end up with no faith at all. And that's the destruction of it. Too many people put faith in God's power to do something. That's why they have this idea that if they, with their words, continue to confess something, God's got to do it because it's his word. It's called witchcraft, by the way. But God doesn't do it because it's in his word. He does it because of who he is, and he does it based on who he is. He is not going to step outside of who he is. And most of these people want a Santa Claus... Or they want a, what? A sugar daddy that will comply and do what they want them to do. And basically, they're, the reason they, they love this type of faith is so that they can avoid true faith. You know what true faith is all about? Total 100% dependency on God. That's what true faith is about. We don't choose faith to be to avoid problems, we choose the way of faith to face those problems, to walk through those problems, and trust that God is in us, in that situation with us. That he's going to work the details out. That is faith. Faith begins where understanding ceases. And we have to let God be God. Are we going to trust his character? Are we going to trust the circumstances that we see? You have to choose to trust the character of God. Many people get caught up with what he can do instead of falling in love with who he is. Appreciating, worshiping who he is and walking in light of who he is and walking in hand in hand with, his, with love towards him because faith and love walk hand in hand together. Now, we take... A matter in good faith, don't we? I want you to think about that. We take a matter in good faith. We come into agreement based on good faith. There was a time in our culture our word meant everything. If Steve told me something today, I would take him in good faith. I would not sit there and think, can Steve do it? 
You know why? I'm not going to worry about whether Steve can do it. Because if Steve is a man of integrity, which I know he is, he will not, do, he will not commit himself to something he can't do. So if he comes in and he says, Rayla, I'm going to do this. I'm going to take him at his word because I trust his character. I'm not going to sit there and think, can he really do it? Because Steve would not tell me he would do it unless he could do it. And you have to understand that about God. We take everything in good faith what God says. I don't sit there and say, does God want to do it? Or can God do it? I believe according to his character, he wants to do it and he will do it. He will keep his end of the bargain or the covenant or the promise, whatever you want to call it. But people want to see it. They don't want to believe it. That's why the Bible says we walk by faith, not by sight. I choose to believe it before I ever will see it. When you make a, an agreement with somebody, you're not seeing it right then and there. You're trusting it's going to come about because of the character of that person. They're going to bring it about when they can do it. It's all about taking somebody in good faith. And that's what we do with God. Every time we put our confidence in him, we are taking him at, at his word. We're taking him because of that faith. And that's what faith is all about. Everything we do uh, is a matter of faith when it comes to God. We believe him. We trust him because of who he is. A person doesn't make a pledge unless they can fulfill it. God made covenants because he could do it. He could do it. So this is why faith is based on God's character. And we're going to get back to this in Romans a lot. Who is God? He would never promise us something he does not intend to do and he didn't have the power to do. He would never do that. God will keep his promise. Not because he can. I don't do things because I can. <laughs> but because he will. He will. You have to understand God's will is very much a part of what he wants to accomplish in our life. It's a matter of his will. He can do nothing else but keep his promises because he gave them. He can't deny himself. He can't reject himself. He's got to do what he said. And he will not do anything less but what he's promised. We have to get a hold of this because today we want to see miracles instead of see God. And love God and serve God, and trust him to work out those things that we think are impossible. Now, this is how faith works. It's a choice, people. And the reason we talk about it is because these people had that type of witness, that type of faith, that confidence in God, that dependency of God. That's the only way their faith could be that powerful. Faith is a choice. We have to make a choice to believe that what he says is true, regardless of what we see. Even if it doesn't make sense, we need to believe it. How much do you see right now makes sense? Nothing. But you know what? I believe what God says in this word. These things shall happen, but guess what? They signal his coming. So I'm looking for the event, not the circumstances. The circumstances signal to me, but I'm looking for the event. As we will see, faith that results in obedient actions. Oh, could you leave that word out? Faith that results in obedient actions are what God counts as righteous. When you do something because of faith, in God, he counts that as righteous. Because you have nothing to offer him that's righteous. He says so. Your best is filthy rags. It's what is done out of faith 
that is always counted as being righteous. That's God's reckoning method, not mine. And we're going to see that all through Romans. It's, he's going to bring that out constantly. You're going to get it. If you study Romans, if you study faith in Romans, you're going to get it. If you don't pick and choose. And you just look at what it's saying. Now, if Hebrews 11, 6, 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. Hmm. Wow. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. Period. It's not what he can do. That he is who he is. And that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So, faith is about God. It's about seeking him in all matters, trusting him with all details. That's a hard one. And believing in the end that he will fulfill all that he has promised. Now, their faith was known. The Roman saints' faith was known throughout the whole world. What a powerful testimony they had. What a record of their faith. It was sincere, it was real, and it was impactful. So what kind of record, and I ask you this, is your faith establishing? What kind of record is my faith establishing? And we're leaving a testimony. That's why you have Hebrews 11. You know, it's one big testimony. And then in Hebrews 12, it says, this one big testimony of all these people serve as a cloud of witness to you and I. And everybody who walks by faith becomes that part of that cloud of witness. Now, 2 Corinthians 13.5, I often go to this, it says, examine yourselves. Notice it says, examine yourselves. Whether you be in the faith. It's something that you not only walk in, it's something you need to be in. You need to live in it. You need to breathe it. You need to think it. Prove your own selves. Prove that you're in that faith. Your life should show something. And it says, know you not your own selves. Don't you know whether you're in the faith? Don't you know who you are in Christ? Don't you know what you have? Don't you know your testimony? Is what it's saying. How that Jesus Christ is in you. Do you not have that witness, that declaration, Jesus in me, the hope of glory? Except you be reprobates. Except your faith be worthless, useless, and has no effect. There's three things that are called reprobates in the New Testament. The mind that doesn't retain the knowledge of God. Good works that don't come out of righteousness. And your faith that isn't based on Jesus Christ. Those three things are reprobates, are useless. So now we're going to come to the question, where is your dependency? Is it on God? Because that can, that's going to determine how impactful your faith is going to be. What kind of testimony it leaves. Now, Paul is clearly establishing and declaring that God to be his witness. And you have to understand, he is, he is establishing something that's very important here. As we get into this letter more and more, you'll realize how important this witness of God is. Because God uh, is, a, he, he's saying God will establish this. If God doesn't establish a witness, it's not true. So you can say all kinds of things, but if God is not part of that witnessing, yes, yeah, true, it's not true. Okay, just, just let me tell you that. It's just that bottom line. He also uh, wants to ensure that he is serving God. He's serving the Lord Jesus Christ. He serves in the spirit of God to proclaim the gospel of the Son of God. We talked about him praying for them without ceasing. Make a mention of them always in prayers. That's what 
that's what we're supposed to do as priests. We're part of a priesthood, people. That's an intercessor. We have a tendency to pray for the world instead of for the saints. We need to get our what? Our priorities right. We need to pray for the saints because they're out in the world. And then we can pray for the world. But we have to realize that we're to stand in the gap for the saints. Because they're, some of those saints are in front lines. And we need to pray for them. So Paul had a real burden for them. He clearly loved the Roman saints. He identified with them in their faith. And I'm going to prove it to you. He's going to mention that. He came under the burden of seeing them advance forward in their Christian walk and their witness. Now Paul so loved them that he mentioned making a request in prayer. Now, what we're going to look at, you might think, well, that's not really... Is that all that important? People, the whole book of Romans hinges on this. And it's a, it's a point we can overlook, but it is so very important. So we're going to look at it in verse 10. He says, Making request, if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. What was his request? He says, I want to come unto you. I want to come unto you. Now you have to remember what Paul was saying. He says, I want to come unto you by the will of God. I want to come to you, okay? His heart was to go to this group of Gentiles. Why did he want to go to this group of Gentiles? Well, look at that in verse 11. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end you may be established. He wanted to establish them. He wanted them to be able to function and operate in their gifts. Now remember something about these people. They heard the gospel and they all come to Rome. They create their own church, but they haven't had an apostle to establish them. Now, you've got to think about that. They were sort of out there. And yeah, they had the gospel down, but how established were they as a church to function as a church? They were being responsible. And Paul wanted to go there, and he wanted to, to establish them. Now, think about Paul for a minute. Remember what we talked about. We talked about that he was an apostle to who? The Gentiles. Now what's he talking about here? He's saying, I want to fulfill my calling. I want to go there and be an apostle to the church of Rome and establish them. That's what I want to do. Now you would think God would see, translate him right there. Think about that for a minute. He would translate him like that. And he'd be right there, right? And he'd be established in that church. That's the thing that would make sense to us, isn't it? Think about that for a moment. This was Paul's calling. He wanted to fulfill his calling at the church of Rome. And yet he says, uh, but I haven't made it. Now he's praying about it. Here's a man that had power in his prayer closet. He was basically saying, God... They're a new church. Send me there. And he wasn't getting an answer. It was an unanswered prayer. And you think, well, I'm sh that doesn't make sense. Why didn't God send him there? That doesn't make sense to me. Do you think it made sense to Paul? I mean, he's not accusing God. He's saying, I, I recognize that I have to do it within his will. Now, we get a very important point here. It's called sovereignty of God. Sovereignty of God. God allowing something or not allowing something. God is totally sovereign over everything. Nothing happens without God. Now there's three um, stages or three types of wills that God operates. 
He, he operates in a permissive will. That's where he permits something to happen. It's not his will. It's not his heart. But he permits it. You know why? Because man has his own will. And God can't step across his will. So often when he permits something, you're going to pay the consequences. Then there's a providential will of God. It's where you say, usually you say this when you've done it your own, right? You've done it your way. You say, God, have your way. So what he begins to do is he uses circumstances and different things to start lining you up to walk in his way. To prepare you to do his will. But you have to have way before you have will. And so that's why I often say to God, have your way. Because I know his way will lead me to his will. And oftentimes we want his will without his way. It can't happen. Okay, it just can't happen. So God, have your way. Line me up. Do what you have to. So line me up to your will so when I come, I'm going to walk and be obedient in your will. So Paul was saying, I'm trusting the sovereignty of God. I don't understand, but I want it according to his will. Because sovereignty is always associated to the will of God. We don't connect those two things, but we need to. And Paul was definitely connected. Okay, this is the will of God, okay? He wanted to go, and he wanted to establish them in spiritual gifts. Now, most of the time when we talk about gifts, we think about all oh, those gifts in 1 Corinthians. No, he also talks about gifts in Romans. It's very interesting. He's talking about establish them in these gifts so that they can be functioning as a body and edify each other in those gifts. It's also, and this always amazed me, in Romans eleven twenty nine. 29, this is what he says, for the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. In other words, when God gives you a gift, he doesn't change his mind and take it back. Now, you can abuse that gift. You can neglect it. You can ignore it. But he's not going to take it back. That's what Paul says in here. And it's in the book of Romans, not Corinthians. So let's look at 12 now. That is that I may comfort together with you by the mutual faith, both, you, both of you and me. So he says, I'm going to come there. I'm going to comfort you. I'm going to encourage you. And I, because of our mutual faith, there are like faith. There's tremendous agreement in faith. And he recognizes they have a mutual faith. That's why he appreciated their faith. They understood that you had to depend on God, you had to look to God, that God was the essence of all of this. Now let's look at 13. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purpose to come unto you. Did you notice that? He said, I don't want you ignorant. I don't want you to think I've left you out there that I have not wanted to come to you because I have wanted to come to you. I have wanted to come to you. That I might have some fruit among you also even as among other Gentiles. He wanted to encourage an environment in them where they would have fruit. So you sit there and think, God, why, why did you prevent Paul from going. Now, think about this for a moment. Look at Paul's letters to the other churches. Most of those churches he had been to, hasn't he? Uh, he'd been to those churches, and it got back to him that they were having problems. So when you look at Paul's letters, he's dealing with present-day problems. Their problems at that time, like in Corinthian, they had a fornicator, uh, we could go on and on and on. So he is dealing with the issues of that particular church. Let's say that God went, that God allowed Paul to go to the Roman church before this letter. Would we have the letter 
that we have because of that? I want you to consider that for a moment here. Because what does Paul write in this letter? Some of the most profound, fundamental beliefs of the Christian faith. He wrote it because he couldn't go to the Romans to establish them in it. Now, is that not incredible? Think about that. If Paul had gone to the Romans before he wrote this letter, and he wrote another letter, we would not have the fundamental beliefs because Paul couldn't go there in person to establish them, so he wrote a letter to establish them. Now, this is an important part of the Roman letter. Paul is saying, I'm writing this letter because he's not letting me come. And it's my way of establishing a record with you that will establish you in your faith. See, God wanted him to do that. Did Paul have that understanding? Okay, he's looking at this. He wants to go to, to the church of Rome. I want to get in there. I want to, you know, help those people. And he's hindered and he's prevented and he's getting frustrated. And he's thinking, man... I got to do something. Those people are out there dangling. Oh, I know what I'll do. I'll write them a letter. And I will put every fundamental belief of the Christian faith in that letter to establish them. Now, I've always looked at this book as a placement because of the importance it puts on the gospel. But it's also one of the greatest books on the fundamental beliefs of the Christian faith you will find. I come to this book all the time to confirm something. And it establishes a Christian. If they really would, would study the book of Romans to establish themselves in the Christian faith, they would have a very strong understanding of such issues as the gospel, as such issue as faith, righteousness. All these things are in this book. And it's all because Paul couldn't manage to get there because God would not allow him to. He was forcing him to write the letter for you and me. Now that's an incredible thing that Paul probably would never thought. Well, now I'm writing this letter. God's forced me to write this letter so that Rayola, 2,000 years down the line, can learn so much from it and will use it to establish people on the true foundation. What's in the book of Romans, the Romans road? If you want to understand the extent of sin, read chapter 3 in Romans. If you want to understand the law and how it works, read chapter 3 in Romans. If you want to understand your life hid in Christ, read chapter 6 of Romans. If you want to understand what happened to the law because of what Christ did, read chapter 7 of Romans. If you want to understand the incredible love of God, read chapter 8 of Romans. I could go down the line. And I'm just hitting a few spots here and there. I'm not even beginning to speak about the great depths of the doctrine, the beliefs, the fundamental beliefs of the Christian faith that's in this book. And it's all because Paul couldn't get there. He couldn't get there. So I said, okay, I'm going to write it. You see, God's sovereign will has something far greater in mind and than we can sometimes see. We can see our callings. We can see what we're supposed to do. But God can see the whole picture and what he wants to accomplish. We can't see that whole picture. We can just see, okay, God, this doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't need to make sense. 
be responsible <laughs> with what's in front of you and do what you can. Now, Paul could write a letter. So he did what he could. And what a powerful book we have today. Simple thing. I purpose to come to you. <laughs> okay? I purpose it that I might be part of some of the fruit produced among you, even as other Gentiles. But he couldn't come. He couldn't come. And today, because of an unanswered prayer, because God didn't answer his prayer, we have the book of Romans. So many times we think, God, why aren't you answering my prayer? Can't you see I'm trying to serve you? Can't you see what I'm trying to do here? But you know what? God's sovereignty entails a greater picture. It entails all of eternity. And what God is trying to do, and we can't see that. That is a mystery of God. It's a mystery that's not for us to know. I'm going to tell you what we need to know is right in Scripture. That's what we need to know. That's what we need to be faithful to. And if you're faithful to that, you will understand what Paul was talking about, the fruits. What he wanted to accomplish by going to them personally. Every time people studied the book of Romans, Paul's coming to them personally. He's speaking his heart. He's challenging. He talks about the beauty of the gospel. He talks about our adoption. He talks about just tremendous things. And he makes comments about some of these things in the other books, in the other letters, but nothing like he does in Romans. So maybe today you may have some unanswered prayer, right? And you say, God, I don't understand. And he said, will you trust me? Well, God, it's an unanswered prayer. You know my heart. I want to do your will. Will you trust me? Will you trust the sovereignty of me knowing what needs to be done? Will you trust that? Paul had to. And because he trusted, the letter of Romans is an ongoing edification that edifies us today. And we're talking about over 2,000 years ago. So there's so much in Romans, right? We're just touching the surface. And it's incredible to me as I study this that God used an unanswered prayer <laughs> to put forth an inspired legacy for each generation to benefit from, including our generation, if we will take advantage of it. How many of us consider unanswered prayer as God not hearing, not seeing, not caring, making it hard for us to be available to do what he has ordained. But God's ways are higher. They're higher. We're not going to always understand. They're higher, though. And we all have to just simply trust the closed doors. <laughs> but I keep getting tired of hitting my nose, right? Knowing that God is working something out of far greater significance, not only for the sake of his glory, but for generations that follow. So that's why we have the book of Romans. It sets an incredible tone. I believe that's why it's one of the first books too, besides the presentation of the gospel, is that it gives you a powerful, if you want to study it, understanding of the fundamental beliefs of the Christian faith. 